Greetings, comrades! Have you ever been to Moscow region? I'm not referring to Moscow itself or its suburbs, but to the region, oblast in Russian. If you have visited the cities on its outskirts, you may have noticed something interesting. Tourists there may be greeted with a jocular question. Oh, they exiled you to 101st kilometer too? In some places there are even memorial signs, like this one. So what is this mysterious expression, 101st kilometer? Let's spill the beans right away. This is the distance from Moscow. And 100 kilometers around Moscow was the area in which unreliable citizens were forbidden to live during Soviet times. For those people who still wanted to live closer to the capital settled right outside the zone, at the 101st kilometer. Let's discuss where it all came from, who fell under the category of unreliable citizens and how it affected the cities that were located on that unfortunate 101st kilometer. <laughs> I want to make two things clear. First, 100 kilometers is a rather relative thing. For example, the town of Balabanova, which was a popular relocation site, is only 96 kilometers from Moscow, while Pitushki, another classic one, is 117. Nevertheless, they both qualify for our topic today. Second, such zones existed not only around Moscow. They were also placed around the capitals of Soviet republics, large cities, St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk, Kharkov, around closed and secret cities. The zone around Moscow was just the most obvious and most clearly delineated one. But first, let's talk about where this phenomenon came from. Even the English Wikipedia knows about it, but it mentions that it was an exclusively Soviet phenomenon. Of course, this is not true. We can go quite far back in history and recall ancient Rome, Greece or the Chinese Empire where undesirable figures were removed from the capital. In particular, recall the trial of Socrates. One of the punishment options for the great philosopher was banishment from Athens. Socrates, however, chose poison. Ovid, on the other hand, was not as radical and calmly agreed to move from Rome to Constanza. Thus, such exiles and banishments have been around since ancient times. If we are talking about Russia and the USSR, then such punishment was applied in Russia even before it became not only the USSR but the Russian Empire. Under the Tsars, there was quite an official measure of punishment, with prohibition of residents in and then variation. Moscow and St. Petersburg, provincial cities, the European part of the country and so on. But back then it was a judicial or administrative but individual punishment for those particularly guilty. It was often combined with criminal punishment, serve your time and then go to exile. It was not some method of creating a buffer zone free of the plebs. But there was another thing that could be compared to Kilometer 101. Namely, the Pale of Settlement, invented by Catherine the Great, the boundary of the territory beyond which Jews were forbidden to reside permanently, except for the most prominent ones. The difference was that this zone was not created around any capital, but just on the outskirts of the empire. The Soviet authorities, of course, could not ignore such a good idea. And so, after the revolution, the first inhabitants of this area away from the capitals were, of course, counter-revolutionary elements. Well, more precisely, the most active ones were naturally shot, persons of average activity were put in jail, and the more harmless ones were simply exiled according to the 58th article of the criminal code. Such convicts were not allowed to settle within 100 kilometers of Moscow, Leningrad and other big cities. This measure was later extended to family members of the detainees. As a rule, such deportation was for at least 5 years. Sometimes a prison term was given first and after release a ban on settling near large cities. Just like in the Russian Empire, but in a much more extensive way. Thus, from 1921st to 1953rd, more than 3 million citizens were deprived of the right of residence in Moscow, Leningrad, Kyiv, Minsk and other capitals and large cities, as well as in closed and port cities – Sevastopol, Odessa, Dnipropetrovsk, Vladivostok. In addition to the political ones, recidivists and other criminal convicts were deported to 101st kilometer too, 
usually after serving their sentences in a penal colony. Of course, the contingent of these towns was not limited to these two categories. After the war, they began to exile people who were social parasites, those who were for some reason not officially employed. For example, lived of their own subsistence farming. Mentally ill people, people with disabilities and other citizens who could not justify their unemployment often got this punishment too. In exile, they were compulsorily involved in socially useful labor, most often in manufacturing. For example, the Nobel laureate Joseph Brodsky, you probably know him. In 1964, he was prosecuted under the Parasitism article and sentenced to five years of forced labor. They didn't give him any credit for being a poet. True, he was exiled far away from the capital, much farther than 100 kilometers, to the Arkhangelsk village of Narenskaya. Another Nobel laureate, Andrei Sakharov, was also deprived of the opportunity to visit the capital in 1980. Common people could also be deported for systematic drunkenness and antisocial lifestyle. Frequently exiled were gypsies, women leading promiscuous lives, vagabonds and street beggars. But by far the most epic moment associated with this concept was the 1980s Olympics. Although similar tactics have been used during other major events, the celebration of the 800th anniversary of Moscow in 1947, the youth festival in 1957 and so on. So the Olympics are being organized in Moscow. The whole world will be watching the event. We need to show the Soviet Union in its best light. How can we achieve that? How about clearing the streets of everything that doesn't fit into the ideal Soviet picture of the world? Everything and everyone. Nice. In July 1979, the Secretariat of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union approved Protocol 168-6C on temporary restrictions on entry into Moscow during the Olympics 80 and sending citizens of Moscow and the Moscow region to the construction teams, sports and pioneer camps and other places of recreation in the summer of 1980. During the month of the Olympics, all Moscow railway stations and airports were closed to mere mortals. It was impossible for an ordinary man from the provinces to get to the capital. But this was only half of it. How do we deal with those individuals who are already in the capital? It's simple. We take them all and evict them all. Yes, during the Olympics, Moscow was practically deserted. Not only unreliable elements were expelled, homeless, mentally ill, hooligans and slackers, citizens with criminal records, dissidents and prostitutes. Although some prostitutes were allowed to stay, especially trained ones. Even potentially unreliable people, such as almost all students, were expelled from Moscow. If the students were officially sent to the countryside for practical training, then people from the first categories were simply caught on the streets, put into buses and transported beyond the 101st kilometer. Remember that the passenger trains back to Moscow were cancelled. What a brilliant plan! By the way, they said that in 208, Beijing repeated this story and removed almost 2 million people from the capital for a month. As a result, a whole circle of very curious towns was formed around the Russian capital. Alexandrov, Kolomna, Shatura, Zaraisk, Ruza, Mazhaisk, Dubna, Stupina. On the one hand, intelligentsia lived in them, exiled to these places for their cultural and political views. They were exiled, but continued to work diligently. On the other hand, these places were populated by blatantly asocial and criminal elements, released from prison but not allowed back into decent society. They didn't really want to work and live peacefully. All of this created a zone around the capital and other major cities, with the specific marginal criminal contingent, a socialist ghetto, so to speak. Which is why the 1960s and 70s saw periodic outbreaks of anti-police riots and pogroms there. Today, however, these towns are mostly populated by the grandchildren of the people who were exiled there. 
so the differences between these towns and other settlements of the Moscow region have become somewhat blurred. Therefore, I want to believe that 101st kilometer will remain just a half-forgotten thing of the recent past. Although, from time to time, the state Zuma comes up with ideas to revive this beautiful tradition. So far, fortunately, these ideas have been rejected.